So I, I want to, I will, uh, as a, since I have a science background, have always been in academics, I have never been in the private sector. My views are academic views. And uh, they're not government views because I was only in government temporarily. Uh, so I talk from the perspective as, of a science community guy uh, who has a, feels like we have a social responsibility to, to do for our public just as they provide the resources for our grants, so must we provide knowledge to them and outputs to them, whether in the biochemical, biomedical community or the food and agriculture community. When I talk about agriculture, I don't talk only about food, but also the growing bioeconomy, the parts that, that make a sustainable society at, by the end of this century. And preparing for that, and, and all built on photosynthesis and on plant, uh, plants and agriculture and forestry and, and aquaculture, we have an enormous challenge to get set for the time when, there, when we must have a fully sustainable earth. And that will come for the, through energy captured from the sun through photosynthesis. So we will all come off of new carbon, not off of old carbon. But it takes science and technology to get there. And, the, and the, I don't think any of us will argue that we're not going to solve these problems by simply wishing them to go away, but rather that your job and my job is, is develop solutions. So I want to talk about uh, th this topic today, but uh, if you'll allow me some latitude, I'll put a little science in once in a while. So the challenge is this one. It's not just the world population that we uh, growth that we face in the next century, but really it's the energy of consumption, uh, the consumption of energy that we have to worry about as well. And and so the the challenge is is more than just people. It's it's all the things that people need. We, if we uh, in the U.S. Department of Agriculture and based upon some inputs from the National Academy of Science of the U.S. and the, and the World Academies of Science. These are the obvious of the, uh, of the 20th, 21st century challenges, in addition to some other things you put there. But, but we, we know that this is important, not just security of the amount of calories, but sufficiency and quality of calories. The food must be safe. The environment must be safe as a, as a consequence. Nutrition and health are important, bioenergy and biomaterials, and we're all on the basis of climate change. It's interesting that these major challenges, many, of which, many that are shown here, which have medical implications, are rooted in agriculture and food. And, and so we are fundamental. And, and so the, I, I use this often to help my colleagues in the biomedical community realize that there's another form of life also. They're, they're green things, not just white things and red things, but they're green as well. So I, uh, this I will uh, talk about in, uh, in it's sort of in a general outline, only a general outline because I can't st stick to a script. I will, I will jump around. Uh, but I want to talk about the role of advance of science. And I'll give you a couple of examples from my lab. And then the challenges and solution really include this, include this question, and, uh, and the role that policy will play in, in helping us to achieve our goals or to use our, our knowledge to benefit humankind. These are the assumptions that we can make based upon the recent uh, two or three decades, that we will have crop and forestry failures and fishery failures, uh, and, uh, and policy decisions that come will cause uh, price, uh, food prices to spike and recede, spike and recede. But increasing the baseline is up. In 10 years, the food will cost more, not less. We've lived in a, in a period of about 50 years where, in fact, the percentage of our income that's spent on food has gone down. It will go up because the needs will be greater and the challenges will be greater. And, and research and, and development will be driven by a few conditions. Again, these are my opinions. They'll be driven by uh, your imperatives and the world imperative, whether the United Nations or UNESCO or, or the World Health Organization or your government, to eliminate hunger and malnutrition. They'll ask us to do this more effectively. All of these things must come, crops, nutrition, biofuels, biomaterials, with less water and less fertilizer. You'll expect that. You should expect that. And society will want abundance, they'll want safety, and sufficiency, and sustainability. Those are given. So the role of science is to achieve those goals while, the, while facing the next two and a half billion more people on Earth in the next 40 years. 
So a number of, uh, of scientists and policymakers and technologists have agreed that this can only be done by intensification. We have only about 10% more land to put into, into cultivation. Much of this, interestingly, is in sub-Saharan Africa, where we think there is no way to produce food, but in fact, they have enormous resources. And in 25 years, if this is done right, Africa will be a net exporting nation of food. They will be our breadbasket bas bread for other parts of the globe because they have the, they have the capability if they have the policy and the science and, more importantly, they look at their natural resources, save the soil, improve the soil, make the soil better so that the seeds can grow better. Brazil did this in, in, to e extreme success. They had a, a, a part of their land was the Cerrado, and the Cerrado was seen to be the most devastated land. It was rained all the time, and the soil uh, nutrients leached out. But they began to grow uh, crops which, whose roots would produce nitrogen, fixed nitrogen. Then they began to add biomass. And in, in five years, now the Cerrados is one of some of the most productive lands on the globe because we use science to go back and help to make the soil better. So the knowledge of, soil, knowledge of science helps us to, to, to do more, but you can't do it by giving up and saying there's too much rain, there's not enough water collection, there's not enough irrigation, there's not enough seeds. You have to face the facts that you can use your knowledge to solve the problems. And so, but with all of that, the FAO says that we must increase food by 70%, perhaps doubling food production by 2040. You can't do that on the same amount of land or even 10% more. You must make, produce more corn, more soya, more, more uh, eggplants, more tomatoes on the same parcel of land. So if that's the case, uh, it requires adequate quantity and quality at an affordable price. Uh, I don't know about you, but I would prefer not to put half of my money into food. I would like it still to be affordable. And we recognize that there should be local production as much as possible, but that local production should be highly effective, should be intensive there too. And it should be, must be sustainable to maintain, and, and sustainability means to me two things. One, economic sustainability and environmental sustainability. You can have all the environmental sustainability you like, but if the farmer doesn't make a living and it's not economic, he leaves. And the land is left for someone else. So you need both, the profit, and, and, the, and, the economic, and the ecological sustainability. And this will require technology. There's just not any way around it. We can't do it the old way. When you go to Africa and say, well, what, you can do everything in, in this old-fashioned way by organics, and, and they say, we've tried this for 400 years. It doesn't work. We need to have better irrigation, better fertilizer in order to make it functional. So. Uh, now, I, I, I often need to remind people who have not a, a farm and agriculture background that all of this relies on, on knowledge. The goal, and, and I'm going to talk in my presentation not about irrigation, not about fertilization, but mostly about the genetics of, of seeds. And, and the geneticists who have, for more than 100 years, been developing new varieties of crops are, are looking, the whole job is to look for diversity. In the old times, we would go back to the, the uh, wild species and do wild crosses, or we would do protoplast fusions or some way to integrate the genome of a, of a close relative with a crop relative, or a far relative with a crop relative, and look for diversity in nature. When we couldn't find it, we used random mutagenesis. We would, we'd bomb, treat the seeds with with uh, irradiating mutagenesis or with chemical mutations to block, uh, to break chromosomes or to, or to create single uh, nucleotide changes or gaps. We didn't know what we were doing, but we did it by chemical and irradiation mutagenesis. That was acceptable. The, the uh, farmers would plant these in the fields and then would choose the ones that would look best. And the breeders used this for many years very, very effectively. About 30% of the varieties that you have today come from chemical mutagenesis. Uh, then later, uh, now we have the ability to use genetic engineering techniques to recreate or recapitulate the random mutagenesis. Once we know where the mutations are, you can go in and use a, 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 a nucleotide fragment, which then uh, changes a single nucleotide in the triple helix as the, as the DNA unwinds and the RNA or, uh, fragment goes in and, 
and matches and makes that change. So we have advanced genetic to get to um, create mutations in specific genes or using transgenes to introduce whole regulatory elements into the genome uh, or to use genes that knock out unwanted traits. And then that is followed by uh, addition of multiple steps to create, to recreate pathways or to redirect metabolites in a certain direction. And by those means, we have gathered, we have created a new way to, to generate the diversity which is necessary to meet the goals of the breeder. Disease resistance, more vitamins, better uptake of fertilizer, and so forth. And this is so far has worked in the first generation. Now, it's been 25 years since my lab had the first field trial of tomatoes. And we did it from my lab in, in Washington University in 1987. I think that's 25 years ago. We discovered it in 85. So this is old science. It's not new. And so what we're seeing are in the markets are the, old, the first generation of technologies. And, and these have been quite, quite uh, successful. The redu reduction in the use of pesticides, insecticides in particular. Uh, the use of herbicide tolerant crops has also led to uh, more leaving more dry matter and more organic matter in the soil, less, less damage to the soil and more organic matter in, insertion, and so the, the, crops are, the soil is healthier. Uh, it enhances, because it enhances no-till agriculture, reduces loss of topsoil and so forth, and it reduces the use of farm machinery and saves, uh, uh, it, it re, really it's a reduction of greenhouse gases as a consequence of the reduction in, uh, in farm machinery and so forth. So these have been seen as successful based upon their impact on, on intensification and their impact on, on the environment, reducing the chemical load to the environment. These are examples that you have seen, undoubtedly. These are insect-resistant corn. This is what a susceptible corn would be like, and this, this insect is targeted. Uh, this insect is a different one, uh, and it's targeted with another uh, Bacillus thuringiensis protein, which reduces the impact of this, in, in fact, you know, get more of these and don't get these. This is a, a fungal infection which produces mycotoxins as a, as a consequence. This can be quite severe in, in parts of South Africa. This product in, uh, is being uh, now commercialized in Burkina Faso after being commercialized in, a, in about 28 other countries. This is uh, cotton that has insect resistance. So the technology is, is, uh, it has proven itself in, in, in the big crops, in cotton, uh, soya, maize, and canola. This is, a, this is not cotton. This is, uh, uh, and I show you this because my, this, is the la this is a derivative of the work that we did in my lab in 85. Uh, this is, a, this is a, 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 a field which is infested with a disease, uh, pap papaya ring spot virus, and it devastates, it, it kills the trees, it, it lives in cucumbers and melons and weeds, and then is transmitted to, uh, by aphids to the to papaya. Uh, the disease causes these round circles. This is a papaya from Hawaii, and it was quite severe. Some of you who don't know the story, uh, the papaya industry was essentially eliminated from, from Hawaii because of this disease, and then uh, plant breeders in the U.S. Department of Agriculture and in the University of Hawaii got together and then applied the technology that we had used on tomatoes into papaya. And, and then created a uh, successful outcome, which was papaya trees that could live now for their full generation. Normally, papayas will live for eight or 10 years and be bearing fruit. And with the virus, they would live only, only one season or less before, be ha before having to be replanted. So this was done by the public sector, the government sector. This is a field trial before commercialization. But this product is now has been commercialized since about 2000, 1999 or 2000. The same technology was used in, in cucumber, in squash. Uh, um, what's the Italian name for squash? Uh, aubergine. Is it aubergine? Zucca. Zucca. So this is, uh, this is the resistant one, and this is the one that has virus. But it, it has moved very slowly, because uh, what happened in the meantime was that the cost of regulation of this technology became so high that, that the academic community, the public community, stopped doing it because it now had to be regulated so much it became too expensive. And of course, the vegetable market is relatively small in comparison to corn or to soya. And so what moved ahead 
were the large crops that had lots of opportunity for profit and, and volume. The same technology was, has recently been done in, uh, in Brazil with a, with a uh, at the disease which causes the uh, beans to be, uh, to be shrunken in, in height, shrunken in, in production, and, and you see here the yellowing of the leaves. This is typical disease symptoms for viruses. This uses a similar technology. It's really now RNAi-based technologies, which are using, uh, uh, have used that same uh, approach to develop insect or virus-resistant uh, beans. This is done entirely in the public sector. It's only, it's only useful in Brazil. The disease is not in the Caribbean, it's not in the US, but it's found only in Brazil. But now, it's, now the disease has moved into Argentina, so Argentina is now asking also for these beans because it has a solution that allows the farmer to be productive in his field at a higher level and not need to use insecticides to kill the insects that carry the disease. So he benefits both ways. So I, uh, and, and, and the reason that this is, in, I, I raise this for several reasons. Uh, virus resistance is, is prominent in vegetable crops. And in fact, one of the very first products that was developed from the technology was for Italy. It was, it was targeted specifically for Italy. In tomatoes, you have a disease called cucumber mosaic virus, and there are two strains of it. And in Italy, it gets so bad that, that it's, the tomatoes are very small, and they have, uh, on the outside of the skin, has a yellow and red and green splotches. And uh, so this product was developed entirely for, for Italy. It was tested here. And then, then the end came because of the regulata regulatory costs. And that was, that was created and, in, in, I think, developed in 1991, 92, 93. So but it, it began with the work in our lab with tobacco mosaic virus, which, as you know, is a model system. And it, we used the gene that encoded the capsid protein. In other words, we made more capsid protein, and, then, and it, it in, in, engendered innate immunity. And, uh, or increased innate immunity. It's effective in some classes of virus, but this technology is now in generation two. It's largely replaced by small RNAs. And, uh, and, and then there's a, there are other examples. But, I'm a, but this model is re really very easy. It's, now a, it's almost a cookbook. You go into the uh, virus-infected plant, harvest a sample, do deep sequencing to identify the small RNAs that are, that are coming from the virus and then synthesize the genome of that sequence, which is, is overexpressed in the plant, and then develop a transgene that increases the amount of small RNAs to the same level or less level than during virus infection. In, 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 in other words, you just simply in, increase innate immunity. Uh, you all know how RNAi works, and it, it works very effectively in the control of viruses if you choose the right sequence and then develop transgenic plants, confirm the presence, and, the, uh, and then test for resistance. So it's, it can be done by any plant breeder in any university. It, and, and that's what plant breeders used to do. They used to look for diverse ways of controlling viruses. When we control the insects with chemicals, we control, we'd limit the disease. But if there's not a, set, a, a source of disease resistance in the wild population, you look for other ways of diversity. This was one that they took up. And many plant breeders did this all over the world. And then came the question of biosafety, and it all stopped. And so breeders in the public universities are no longer able to solve the problems that they had been given because of the question of the technique of, bi of biotechnology. Not the product, but the technique of genetic engineering. Is, this, is it safe? Is it something we want to do? And, uh, and we've, we now have uh, used it in, from, from the Danforth Plant Science Center for a, a, a product that is now de being developed for use in, in Uganda, more than 30 months of, trans, of, of testing, and it's, it's really uh, extremely effective to control a disease on yucca, manioc, uh, cassava, tapioca, and the many names for this crop. Uh, and uh, it, this is the resistant one, which has the RNAi te uh, technology, and this is the, this is the uh, susceptible parent variety. So our hope is that eventually this will be useful. The farmers in, in, uh, in, in Uganda want it yesterday, want it now because it is so good, but, but they can't, of course, have it because it's not been approved through regulations. Again, we're regulating RNAi. We're not regulating a protein. We're not regulating any allergen. We're regulating RNAi. And so you, so you begin to see the question of, of at what basis do we regulate? Uh, 
Uh, now I get to tell you 25-year-old science and, and only five-year-old science. But, so this was the work in my lab, and I, I'm leading to a point here. This is not just self-engrandizement, there, there's a point here. Uh, and here this is the example of resistance to tomato mosaic virus by coat proteins. And I love, I love the, the, to understand the mechanism, and so we did some structural biology, and our model was that the reason it was working was that the cell is making coat protein, which self-aggregates and then re-aggregates on the particle as it comes in to prevent disassembly. So to prove that model, we had to look at the structural sequence, the structural biology of the capsid protein. And uh, we then, we knew that this, uh, this pair of acidic amino acids was, was, was um, balanced by a calcium in this site, which neutralized that charge, so it held, held them together instead of pushing apart. We then began to make mutations in these amino acids and others in order to make the, the, the bonding even more tight. And by doing that, we developed a, a series of plants that, that uh, were highly resistant. This is a plant pathology kind of experiment. You grow plants up, you inoculate them in virus and say, are you sick or are you not? And uh, this the controls the, non, the parent variety becomes sick, uh, shows very strong symptoms in nine or 10 days. These are other mutations in this site which gave high levels of immunity. Other mutants uh, destroyed the immunity, and, and so if you pull them, push them apart, and don't let them aggregate. So we're learning about mechanisms. And that's, it's great fun because if you look at the crystal structure, you know just about where, how it would change it. And from a perspective of, of, of intellectual uh, excitement, it was high. And the question is, who cares? You know, I, yes, I, I got recognized and I got to be awarded stuff, but who cares? Who are we doing it for? As a matter of fact, my wife asks that all the time. Why are you doing this? Are you doing this to become famous or are you doing this to become useful? And as I said to my colleagues, like there, I, uh, I, uh, there's this thing in the academic world that we want to be famous, and I often say now, uh, before 55, you want to be famous, and after 55, you want to be useful. <laughs> now, maybe your number is 50, or maybe it's 25. Maybe by the time you're 30, you want to be useful and famous, which is most important. You make that decision, whether in biomedicine or in agriculture. And, and I would say that our respons social responsibility is to do both, to discover new knowledge and to use it. And, and I've been fortunate enough to be able to do that because I think, in fact, this is exciting stuff. I, I'm not a crystallographer, but when I went to Scripps, I learned to work with crystallographers and cell biologists. And, and uh, we even were able to see that this was the, the molecule that was the resistant molecule. <coughs> This is the one that is a wild type, but when you make the change, look at the change in the structure, and it blocks the assembly. It's, it's, it's fun. Uh, and, and, and we get a big, a big excitement from it. But then I was also asked to, asked to be on a committee of directors for a center in India, the International Research Center in near Hyderabad. And this center studies peanuts and, and, uh, and sorghums, and, and, and chickpeas, and there was a disease in groundnut or peanuts which was uh, destroying the size of the peanut. And so the yield was very, very low. In fact, this disease affected more than 10 million farmers. Now, there was in Holland at the time a, a working a, a scientist, a, a virologist, who used our coat protein resistance model against a class of viruses that, that, uh, that to which this disease agent belongs. So we were very simple and said, what happens if we make plants which make the capsid protein of this virus? Would we have resistance? Of course, I wouldn't show you the picture otherwise. Uh, this is the parent, uh, which gets very sick and dies when it gets the virus. And this is a plant which we developed uh, in India using a gene which was developed in my lab uh, based on, on good rules and good rules of gene construction and codon optimization and all that interesting science. And, and this, this uh, is a very effective agent, but it's stuck in the greenhouse because India is not quite sure what to do about biosafety. Meanwhile, the, the disease losses continue to pile, but the resistant varieties are not allowed to be developed for field use. And, and to, to, for, the, for that, my frustration is uh, about, about how, how uh, science is viewed uh, and what basis are regulations made 
based on the science and based on public response. What's the goal, role of science? Uh, what is the role of policymaking? And what is, I, I think, what is your role? As a scientist, how do you respond and why do you respond in one way or the other to the science that you see and the science you hear and the YouTube about, uh, about no vaccination or the YouTube about no GM foods or the YouTube discussion about whether or not it's creationism or evolution? In my country, we have a problem. In the US, we have a problem with, with the anti-science side of stem cells because of the Catholic Church. We have an anti-evolution uh, uh, movement uh, and a, 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 a pro-creation movement because of the church and, and of, of both sides, the Protestants and, and the Catholics. So we've got a problem of, of how science is viewed. Uh, uh, and and uh, I think that's where I want to head in the next part of my talk. As part of this, I think we can advocate for change and regulations based on science knowledge. And uh, so if I was a regulator, my goal would be to seek ways of totally deregulating RNAi for the use to control diseases and insects, because that's what the plant does anyway. But this won't succeed if we say, wait a minute, the public doesn't like anything about GMOs, therefore we shouldn't study it. That's, not, that's like burying your head in the sand. So our goal should be to be proactive and informing policy about what is scientific validity, and then finding some ways to move this, uh, the science and technology forward. This is a, this, uh, uh, my last slide, uh, has many sections, of course, about this topic of virology. There are other ways that we also worked. We, we also worked on the disease in, uh, in, in the Philippines, which was caused by two viruses. And we had tried um, capsid protein mediated resistance here. On, for this, against this virus and against this one, had an only moderate success. And RNAi didn't work very well. So we were studying the disease itself, and, uh, and we had then a, a conclusion after about six or eight years of study. The disease is acquired, the agents are acquired by an insect. The insect transmits to the, to the plant. Uh, it's a DNA virus, a double-stranded DNA. It uses transcription factors which live only in the vascular tissue of the plant. And it, it uh, uses an enormous amount of it. And so, there, uh, so our model is that it creates a shortage. And so it prevents the plant from elongation. And that looks to be the case. Because what we did then was to uh, introduce a transgene made entirely of rice fragments, of uh, create a, a gene from rice, the same variety of rice, just reiterated the amount of that transcription factor, just overexpressed it. Two things could happen. The plants could get sicker faster, or the plants could outgrow the disease. In fact, the latter happened. And uh, so this is the stunting which causes by infection. And these are transgenic lines of different types that overexpress either this transcription factor called RF2A or RF, or RF2B. It did not do anything with this transcription factor. There's another one. Of course, this pre-transcription pre assembly is complex. It's multiple factors in different sites on the chromatin, and they bend together. So we, we, we tested a number of transcription factors. This one lies immediately upstream of the Tata box, uh, just without about 10, 10 or 12 nucleotides away. And uh, it was great fun. Again, uh, it's great fun to discover the science. And, and now uh, my hope is that this rice will be in the field, but it's not. It's still in the greenhouse. And, and, and so we are, we, you, you attempt to answer a social, a social need or a, a, a disease need, and, and then you find that your science can't be taken outward. Now, now breeders are using even better ways. What I told you about was first generation, uh, first generation genetic engineering, and now we have many different, uh, different approaches. With high frequency mutagenesis and high throughput sequencing, we can identify varieties that are what are the phenotype we want and know exactly what nucleotides are changed but randomly. And then using uh, site-directed nucleotide changes, we can target those genes to, to, to recapitulate what happens up in random mutagenesis. Uh, site, we can do site-specific uh, gene insertions. We, uh, making, we have artificial chromosomes that work th through multi-generations in plants. So you can uh, create whole chromosomes that make multiple pathways. So bioengineering and synthetic biology becomes a, an open book. You can do almost uh, what, you, what science will want and what the market will want and what society will accept. Those things still have to work out. 
uh, possible to inactivate and delete genes uh, at will. We can do, use a, 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 a process to, to use a transgenic plant for a parent and cross it and get rid of the transgenic agent and create a progeny that is non-transgenic but used a transgenic parent as an intermediate. And uh, gene inactivation by RNAi. And now the regulatory agencies don't know what to do. They haven't got a clue of how to regulate new technologies. Uh, I was privileged to, to sit with a group from EFSA uh, in Seville about a, about a year ago. And the goal of that committee was to evaluate these technologies and say, well, what are we going to do with those? Uh, you cannot tell the difference from this creating a single nucleotide change by directed mutagenesis. You cannot distinguish between that one and this one. There's no, there's no footprint. There's no data that's, uh, there's no way you can find it. So if this one, this one is not regulated, and this one is regulated, and it doesn't make science sense. Uh, even this point of getting gene-specific insertions, many of the objections that were made in the, in, in the science regulations is that a gene might insert in the wrong place and cause an allergen or cause a defect. So now we can put it in exactly where we want. And, or we can create uh, chromosomes. So how do you regulate science? Who teaches the regulators what's worth regulating? Do the regulators care? And the second question, and in Italy, your questions are different than ours in the US. And, and, uh, but it comes to this issue of, of how we are allowed to use what we know. There's also a, a new technology that some of you, many of you know about. It's uh, from a company in Israel called BioSelect. In this case, you can uh, treat over the top of the plant with RNAi and get the, get the phenotype you want. So you have a new agrochemical, a, bio, a bioagrochemical, which is a synthetic oligonucleotide that, that is perhaps made out of, uh, out of modified nucleotides that has specific uh, stabilities. So will these technologies supersede these? Is one safer than the other? Is one as efficacious as the other? So, and this isn't the end of it. it. It will change. You will discover new, new knowledge here that will have impact on, on, on a technology, whether this one or another one. And you have to ask how those are regulated. And these, these have really been exciting times because we are asked to be more efficient, more sustainable in our agriculture. So, so these, these goals for agriculture that I talked to you about earlier are achievable. We can have high environmental services, cleaner land, cleaner water off of the lands, by using less agrochemicals or better biological control, but it takes science to understand how to do that. What we have so far are improved seeds. And now uh, we will see in the next five years seeds with increased to drought, heat, and floods. Uh, and it's interesting. The regulatory agent, th these often are using uh, transcription factors to control multiple genes, a sort of a master switch or a semi-master switch. And the agencies don't know how to deal with this because they used to dealing with chemicals that are put on the top to make the plant grow better. And so they're now thinking about uh, DNA as a pesticide or a chemical. So it, 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 it's a lack of understanding of, of the role of biology in the physical uh, surroundings. We have uh, varieties that have increased use to uh, increased nitrogen or fertilizer use. We have, inc we have examples of increase of, uh, of insect, insects, fungi, viruses, bacteria, and nematodes. And this is the, this is the goal. For not, you'd think that this goal would be exactly in line with organic farming and sustainability. This, this goal of number C is exactly what, what most small farmers would like uh, to bring their products to market. The future is even better. And, and at the current time, we have improved seeds that ha uh, in crops that have uh, higher levels of pro-vitamin A, the golden rice you know about, there's a golden banana, golden canola oil, golden cassava, uh, and, and there may, uh, I think there should be golden palm oil, we, there isn't yet. There is a new, as a soy variety which has increased amounts of omega-3 and omega-6, uh, is sort of so-called heart healthy oils that will, we don't think they will replace uh, olive oil, nothing can replace olive oil, uh, but they will be a substitute for for uh, some of the fish oils. And, and these, are, these may become the standard for eating because of the, the healthy attitude of uh, healthy characteristics that are conferred as a consequence of eating more omega-3 and omega-6. This is done by, by um, DuPont Company. 
These are both in, these are in academics, uh, improving calcium and zinc in vegetables and in grains. As you, um, there's, as you know, there's, we have a habit of when we make flour in a, in a mill, we add in uh, more vitamin D and we add in more folic acid. So anything mixing, we just put it in the, in the flour. You make it an E. coli and you just put it in flour. So the opportunity to improve, improve the genetics or the organization, organism to make its own is obvious. It's just simply synthetic biology one more way. Better dietary starch. Uh, I was visiting Malaysia recently, and in the Sukarno era, it was recommended that in order to meet the caloric needs, that they should have rice every three times a day. So they do. A, a meal without rice in, in, in Malaysia is, is not a meal. Uh, and yet they have the fourth, fourth highest level of obesity, of, of diabetes rather, type 2 diabetes. And it's caused be, because rice has a very high glycemic index. And so now the question is, can you increase the complexity of starch in, in uh, rice so that it is still part of diet, but it doesn't make the free sugars and cause the insulin imbalance? Uh, to, and, and then this is a black, this is one that's exciting in many, many places using plants to, to replace industrial chemicals, uh, whether for energy or industrial and, and pharmaceutical precursors. Plants have a, uh, make more than uh, 200,000 uh, different kind of chemicals. Different plants make different precursors. And there's a wealth of information there of new chemistries and, and how to use those fragments of those molecules or whole molecules. And as pharmaceutical drug design is now a, a, has been a, a searching going on for a, a number of years with some success. And if you're an animal biologist uh, and you, have a, you want to look for disease resistance and heat tolerance, you know, the, the uh, reproductive rate of, of both plants and animals drops when it gets above about 35 or 36 degrees. And, uh, and as that goes down, then the productivity in the farm goes down. And so we have to look for ways to, uh, to, to develop uh, strains that will live in Argentina or in, in uh, New Zealand or, or Australia to, with that are heat tolerant. So through this, uh, more feed and food and fiber, replacing petroleum products, getting up, up uh, for, for some societies, and I think Italy is in, in this route, how do you take the science out into innovation and investment and econo economic development is also part of our job. Uh, synthetic biology. Many of these things are threatened by policies and threatened by other industries. Now, this industry is not too keen on biomaterials or biofuels, and they fight us all the time in the U.S. Uh, so we have threats in the policy side and on other economic factors, but, but that will be there. Our job is, I mean, so, some of us would say, all right, we'll wait until the policies are changed. And I take the other attitude. Our goal is to help to change the policies. The reason that bioeconomy is so exciting to me is because, as I mentioned in my first remarks, this is, these things are, it's a huge solar panel and the opportunity to create new materials and new structures uh, is there, but it requires investment in knowledge. Who invests in knowledge? Who is it that should pay for the industry, for the knowledge that's necessary to create this bioeconomy? And then you have to ask, uh, well, what does the bioeconomy want? Well, maybe they don't know what they want, or maybe they are already telling us, but we're not listening. Uh, uh, what is the structure that they would like to make a new fiber? I was talking to, uh, I was sitting on, an, on a, one of my many plane rides beside an executive from Boeing uh, aircraft. That's your competitor to Airbus, Airbus if you didn't know. Uh, and they, Bo Boeing lives in my city. So I ask, uh, when will you make first your wings, your carbon fibers, out of plant products instead of out of, out of synthetic chemistry? And he said, you know, we hadn't even thought about it. How do you use the biology to drive changes in material sciences? What is the relationship between material sciences and engineering of products and the changes of genetics and engineering of plants. They, if you ask the question from the material side, you get a different answer than if you do from the food safety side or a food processing side. So I, it's an exciting field, but somebody has to fund it. And, and uh, we, we tried to make our demonstration of, of how to use it by uh, changing the, uh, this is a cross section of a plant stem, a rabbitopsis it turns out. And these are the, sec these are the tissues with secondary walls, make the lignin around the cellulose. And, uh, and we know that if we destroy this boundary by, by having an antisense uh, gene against this enzyme, 
Now, this ligase, uh, the plant gets so badly affected it just falls over. Well, after all, lignin's important for the tree to stand up and the plant to stand up. So the question is, how can you, can you change that composition when you want it to be changed so that it can stand up but have less lignin and therefore be better for biofuels or other, or other uh, products? So we employed a, a gene switch based on the use of a a, a chemical called methoxyphenicide. It's a small molecule that's approved for insecticide use. And it was extremely effective. And you can, you can so we knocked out, after the plant was growing, we, uh, we gave it a, a shot of the inducer, drenched it with methoxyphenicide, one, one drenching, and, uh, and knocked down gene expression after induction. And of course, you see here the change in the secondary cell wall thickenings. And the, this one was induced, but has a lower level of gene expression than this one. It's a, it's a pretty clean system. And as it did so, we changed the chemistry of the walls into different kinds of, uh, of uh, lignols. There are three different kinds in, in plants, HGNS, and we can reduce one or two or three, depending on how we knock them out. And we can do it with tissue-specific promoters. You can have it only in the leaves or the stems or the roots. I mean, the, the, the technology is not the issue. Uh, and, and so as you move, move forward, you recognize that while we as scientists make, make uh, 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 progress, this gene switch, switch with this system provides a tool for regulating target genes and altering plant metabolites, but, but it's not yet going to make it out because it depends on these guys. It depends on collaboration between us and those who would commercialize. Uh, I had my first grant from a, from a company, Monsanto Company, in 1981. The reason I went to them is because they saw a use for the, the science. I had gone to the government and asked for, for a grant from the US Department of Agriculture. It was declined. They thought there's no chance this would work. And so I w the only, my choice was not to do it or to take money from the private sector. I took money from the private sector. And we were successful. They patented it, and, it, and we patented it at the university, made license, and now it's in, in commercialization. We could not have done it by, by ourselves. So we need the collaborations in new ways. Now, in one way, what I've shown you in the previous slide was that in order to understand mechanism, I had to employ cell biology, biochemistry, structural biology, genetic engineering, and genetics. And, and we're, we're, we need to be more comfortable with multidisciplinary experiences and research, but so do we also in how we, where we go from that. So I think we need to increase collaborations across disciplines and between disciplines and the private sector. So universities, including institutions like this one, will adapt, must adapt, to adopt it and to include expanded collaborations that achieve greater outcomes. We can be in the ivory tower, we can be in our labs and say that this is enough, this is enough. but I, I, Jaco and I were talking earlier and I don't think it's enough. We have to be closer to where we serve. And in that service to society, that relevance gives us the freedom then to give them advice or give them input. But if we don't have that collaboration, know what they want, then we're a little bit left out. And it will, this will change the nature and the composition of colleges of agriculture and, and of others as well. And these private, public, public, private, and government partnerships are increasingly important uh, because nobody can go it alone. Nobody can do it by themselves. There will be partnerships between your region and the next region, or between one state and the next, because these are regional problems, not just one community problem, but they're regional. And so it should open up better collaboration. And my, my, uh, one of the things I did when I was the director of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture was begin to require that there be collaboration, to require there be multidisciplinary, and that be requirement to listen to the needs while you do, before you do the genomics or the cell biology, listen to the needs of society at the same time you think about what your science might be. And then find a way to adapt the fundamental things to the translation things. Because a vibrant e uh, economy and bioeconomy and based on agriculture requires these things. Uh, it needs a, a trained workforce and good knowledge and private sector and global visions, but it requires policy and requires you to think it's important. What are the challenges? to achieving this, and, and why are we still talking about uh, this? And, and, and most of it, it's a limited understanding of how to achieve customer acceptance of biotech, concerns of the food and environmental safety, intellectual property, availability, who gets it, who doesn't. Uh, and and uh, what we do know after 20 years that, this, that the technology itself of genetic engineering is inherently not, is not inherently uh, unsafe. 
it's as safe, if not safer, than plant breeding. We know that after 20 years. So as a scientist, if somebody says to you, is it safe to do gene therapy on a human? You say, well, let me look at the last literature and see what the last experiments were like. Were there any deaths? Were there any cancers formed? In genetic engineering, we now know after 20 years that, there are, that we haven't induced allergens. We haven't destroyed butterflies. We haven't killed the soil. We've built things. So your job as a scientist is to learn the latest, not to make a judgment until you learn the data. And if the data, and, and, and I'll remind us that data, that, con, that a conclusion comes from multi-studies. I was not happy that, about my virus resistance discovery in 85 until 10 other labs repeated it and said, you're right, it did work. So it needs to be repeated. It needs to be statistically validated. And, and when that happens, that's your job. As a, as a science student and a science researcher is not just know your own field, but to know where to get the literature to determine if it's something is safe or not safe. So uh, it, that we know, it's safe. Foods developed uh, by, breeding by other breeding technologies, including uh, the others that we talked about. The, the development of the technology per se is not dangerous, and the foods from those technologies are also not dangerous. We know that after 20 years. But we have a limited understanding of that anti-science sentiment that's in society, and we don't know what to do with it. Because as I said earlier, it's in studies of field of evolution, it's in the field of stem cells, it's in the study of, it's a field of agriculture. And those pieces are, are really bothersome to many of us who are concerned about the future of society and the future of, of humans uh, uh, in, in the, in the, uh, as we increase in numbers. So the same thing happens in bioeconomy. And, and if this economy is going to be successful, it must be generating knowledge and relationship in R&D, co-funding it, and, and really make agriculture not just food, feed, and fuel, but, but that economy that will provide a sustainable future for humankind in this environment. So the other concerns that I have are about this area of regulatory approval. And I've asked, tried to ask people, why are you concerned about the regulatory? What is it that you question? And so some people are worried about who is watching out for their safety. Good question. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and some take a precautionary approach rather than a, using for a specific science-based regulatory. And then there are environmental and health concerns. And are they real or are they perceived? Are they something that we can be afraid of and scared by, by a YouTube advertisement or a, a Greenpeace flat pamphlet? And so you have to decide. And are those real or are they perceived? What do we know after 20 years? And what is, what's the agenda of the opposition? And we know the agendas of some. What's the agenda of the, the pro-science? What is the agenda of the biotech company? What's the agenda of me or of Jocko? What is our, what's our goal in, in speaking? Then there are those who have concerns about socioeconomic issues. And sometimes we let those drive the, drive the boat in regulation. And uh, so some are worried about intellectual property and seeds. Well, often that is raised when they don't realize that for the last 50 years, farmers have been buying hybrid seeds that are intellectually, have, are, have intellectual property uh, because we started learning that hybrid seeds give more, more variety and more yields. But farmers have been driving these for 50 years. This isn't can, a new process of, of royalties. That happens already. So, but some of this comes because we don't have an understanding of how agriculture seeds have been developed in the past. What about the small farmers and the large, who gains? Well, we now know that small farmers have increased their, their profits even higher than large producers because they have more base to build on, but, but they have been equally as benefited by the new technologies and choices, and having those choices need to, are important. Then there's the choice of consumers, sourcing of foods and feeds. And, and there's room for all. There's room for all segments in the economy. There's not, one, one size doesn't fit all. In other words, in, in the US, you have the opportunity for organic and uh, what's called natural or conventional and, 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 and non -trans, and transgenic. So, uh, but biotech has to be used wisely. You have to choose the right technology in the right environment and the right, you know, facing the right, uh, knowing what you're facing. And integrating all solutions, there are no magic bullets. Uh, anything we do in irrigation, in seeds, in in, in research and in development uh, is only a part of the total solution. So recognizing we have limitations 
and implement a strategy based on need and technical capabilities and so forth. So I want to, I have only a few more minutes, uh, but I, I do want to remind us that this isn't just about biotech. It's about the next technologies, whether it's gene therapy or the use of nanotechnologies and biomechanics. Uh, it, it really is in all phases of technology that develops from knowledge. And, and uh, these, who, why regulate? What is regulated? Who regulates? Uh, how little or how much? At what point do we over-regulate until we kill the science? until we stop what's going on. Learning from the past, establish regulations for the present that are based on the past. After 20 years, we, if we have knowledge about how to use a, a virus resistance or BT crop, how should you regulate now after 20 years of experience? And that should change, but it hasn't. It's gone more rigorous instead of less rigorous. And, uh, and how, do you, how do you get uh, moving, how do you move forward out of science? So, there are problems with the public sector, private sector, problems in the public sector. And many of us haven't communicated with the public very effectively. The private sector doesn't have a clue. Remember, I live in the city that has Monsanto in it, and, and we know the mistakes that they've made. So has Pioneer, so has Syngenta, so have Bayer. These companies have not been highly successful in the past. And uh, the question is, how, how can they be successful, or should we be more successful as public voices? If, you, if I am asked about gene therapy, I don't answer a, a question of whether or not that vector from ADD2 or some, what other vector is used, is an effective agent. I go to the literature. And, and I point the direction to somebody who knows. That's, and, and what we find in our public sector that sort of becomes a little bit more broad especially in the science community, and we would need to know our limits, but we also need to know how to, uh, how to, how to communicate. The, uh, I, want to, I want to talk about a limitation that uh, I really apologize. I didn't take two or three slides out, and there are too many here, and I'm going to run out of time. Uh, but, but I do want to get to a, a point of, uh, of discussion about, about this issue of communication. And, and uh, as, you, as you read through these, these kind of slides, you see that these, kind of, that these questions of coexistence and, and conventional organic crops are all things that can be addressed by science as well as by policy. And uh, th this is our goal. If that, if that is truly the goal of agriculture, whether it's agroforestry or agroecology or, or um, uh, agroeconomy, uh, uh, bioeconomy, or aquaculture, then we have that as an overriding question which governs policies. Now, who defines sustainability? That's an often used and often misused word, isn't it? Uh, there are agendas that are built around the word sustainability. I am more sustainable than you. No, I am more sustainable than you. Because it becomes a catchphrase that we see in the media and we see it on, on food products. And, uh, and this, these issues of, of uh, defining sustainability and talking about gene flow and trade, those are all, those are all measurable things. And, and I, I challenge you to think of, of, the, of, the, of your future that not only is discovery, but it's explanation. And it's information that might inform policy as well as, as, well as, uh, as, well as the science that you do. And, and to please believe, as I do, that the public sector, you, and small companies, as well as large multinationals, are, are involved here. This is not the purview of, of a privileged few, or it should not be. It should be the purview of, of, the, of, the, of the community of science. And that uh, many of these that are developed in small companies will be as important as those in large companies. And you may be part of that small company community, but that doesn't make you a, uh, a, 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 a you should not be accused of, of turning, going to the other side as a consequence. Uh, the goals that you have are, are not only local, but they're global. And so the processes for approval of getting these things out from a small company are very, very high. I'll give you an example. When the papaya was developed, it cost about $1.5 million from conception of the idea to releasing to the market. For Faziolus vulgaris, it was $3.5 for the private companies to get 
to get a, a product into the US and to Europe and to Japan and to South America is about 50 to $100 million for each trait. And if, if this cost is low uh, and this cost is high, then you see where the public sector drops out, it discourages innovation and investment and product development. So I, I've given a lot of reasons why science and science regulation needs to be thought about. And you might, it might, might even be rethought. Maybe there should be a change in policies, a cha change in regulations. Build knowledge of the past 20 years locally and globally and change the regulations. Many times I talk to people, I say, well, it's, we don't want to do it because you, it's, regulations are too high. Well, regulations are high for a variety of reasons. Can science change that? Can you go to your government as a scientist and get some, uh, a, different ad a different outcome? We know we can in the US. Policymakers are, are teachable, at least some of them are. And, and with a little luck, now don't, don't, not too much chuckling here. <laughs> I have a challenge here. Some think that there is no, no learning of science by policy. Uh, how many PhDs are in your uh, physics are in your parliament? How many of medicine? How many of law? Many of law. And many of business. We have only a few in, in the US Senate and, and House that come from a science background. How many of you want to be politicians? Eh, too risky. How many of you want to write grant applications? That's also risky. So, so your choices are there, but, but we need science at the highest levels. And uh, when I go to, uh, I, I had the privilege of going to Indonesia recently and meeting with the president. A few of us met with the president at SBY for about three hours. He gave us three hours of his time. We were scientists and communicators. And uh, he, he brought ministers in with him. They were all trained at the best universities in the world, and, most, and half of them were PhDs, the ones that were in that room at the time. So they chose their ministers in a different way than we do. And they're moving science forward as a consequence. What would happen if we did the same thing more effectively in our governance? And, and I don't, so maybe there's a politician amongst you Indonesia. Indonesia. Indonesia, sorry. Uh, so so we, these, these uh, it, it seems like we have examples internationally that we could emulate. Uh, and that may need to, to uh, how products are evaluated, maybe even regional collaboration for, for uh, regulation. Uh, why shouldn't South America from, let's say, all of South America have their own regulatory processes that serve their markets? Uh, that's what's happening with the beans. Or Southeast Asia for rice, so that, that, that they, have, they, they develop their own regulations. And, uh, and, and maybe these new approaches will come with time. But when I mention something that seems so advanced, so far out, so unlikely, uh, often the response is, no, that's too far away. But that has to be what the future is if we're going to have this bioeconomy that provides a stable society in 2100. But we're threatened by this, by the challenge, uh, challenges that are expressed in this paper. I don't know how many of you know Marcel Kunz from Grenoble. There was a paper in EMBO reports in the, in the October issue. It wasn't in the, in the September issue. I checked before I came. But the November, I, think, I believe it's the October issue, uh, an article which talks about postmodern assault on science. If all truths are equal, who cares what science has to say? If a non-scientific approach, a religious approach, raises its level because it says, based on these documents, this is truth, and then you have science, which has its truth based on the experimental methods that you and I grew up on, on what basis are policies made? Whose truth is more truth? And whose truth to whom? And, and Marcel makes a very compelling case that every scientist in this room, every freshman, Entering university in science, you should read it as well, because it does tell us the challenge of, an, of a non-knowledgeable community of what science is. Because those are the ones who vote, those are the ones who scream, those are the ones who burn field trials about GM foods or to demonstrate against evolution, a study of evolution. And, and our job should be to understand what, where we have changed. In the last 50 years, we have moved so much in this direction that it's beginning to be realized in the West. This isn't the case in China. It's also not the case in Indonesia and or in Malaysia. 
It's a phenomenon of the wealthy countries, the wealthy developed countries. I have used a phrase for more than 20 years, the arrogance of plenty. We have a lot, and I'll, and, and I'll just judge based upon my abilities and my financial abilities. And that gives me choices. But many places, many, many inner city poor working people in our society in the US don't have the choices of, of what to buy. That doesn't mean what they buy is not right and not safe. But the point is that this part of, of, of the dialogue is, is finally being understood more effectively in the last 10 years than it was 20 years ago. Even 10 years ago, I refused to believe that this was a problem. I, I think Marcel's right. I hope you'll read it. And I hope you'll take my, my thoughts today in the context of this kind of literature and, and, and find a way for yourself to be engaged in the topics not only of your specific discipline, but those that affect, policy, uh, affect society more globally and see if there's a way that you can play a role not only in your science, but perhaps in your innovation and perhaps in policymaking. Thank you very much.